Would you like free audiobooks? Click the link in the description. Question 1. A patient presents with a pressure ulcer on the sacral area, measuring 3 cm in width, 2 cm in depth, with yellow slew present and no signs of infection. Which action should the nurse take first? A. Apply a hydrocolloid dressing. B. Debride the necrotic tissue. C. Cleanse the wound with hydrogen peroxide. D. Cover the wound with a dry dressing. Correct answer, B. Debride the necrotic tissue. Rationale, debridement of necrotic tissue is crucial in the treatment of pressure ulcers to promote healing by removing dead tissue and reducing the bacterial load. Hydrocolloid dressings are more suitable for wounds with minimal exudate and no necrosis. Hydrogen peroxide is not recommended for routine cleansing as it can damage granulation tissue. Dry dressings are not ideal for wounds with slough or necrotic tissue. Question 2. A nurse is planning care for a patient with a diabetic foot ulcer. Which intervention should be included in the plan of care to promote healing? A. Keeping the wound dry and exposed to air. B. Using an antimicrobial ointment with each dressing change. C. Implementing strict blood glucose control. D. Applying a corticosteroid cream to reduce inflammation. Correct answer. C. Implementing strict blood glucose control. Rationale. For patients with diabetic ulcers, maintaining strict blood glucose control is paramount to promote wound healing and reduce the risk of infection. High glucose levels impair the immune response and increase the risk of infection. Antimicrobial ointment may be used depending on the presence of infection and the wound's condition, but it is not the primary intervention. Keeping the wound dry and exposed might not be appropriate for all ulcers, and corticosteroids can delay healing and increase the risk of infection. Question 3. Which dressing is most appropriate for a wound with moderate exudate and partial thickness loss? A. Alginate dressing. B. Transparent film dressing. C. Hydrofiber dressing. D. Gauze dressing. Correct answer. C. Hydrofiber dressing. Rationale. Hydrofiber dressings are highly absorbent and create a moist wound environment conducive to healing. They are suitable for wounds with moderate to heavy exudate. Alginate dressings are best for wounds with significant exudate. Transparent film dressings are used for superficial wounds with minimal exudate, and gauze dressings are not the best choice for managing exudate and maintaining a moist healing environment. Question 4. A patient with a venous leg ulcer reports increased pain and a foul smell coming from the wound. On assessment, the nurse notes greenish discharge and erythema extending from the wound edges. What is the nurse's best initial action? A. Apply a compression bandage. B. Obtain a wound culture. C. Increase the frequency of dressing changes. D. Initiate antibiotic therapy. Correct answer. B. Obtain a wound culture. Rationale, the symptoms suggest a possible wound infection. The best initial action is to obtain a wound culture to identify the causative organism, which will guide appropriate antibiotic therapy. While compression therapy is essential in managing venous leg ulcers, addressing the infection takes precedence. Increasing dressing changes and initiating antibiotic therapy without culture results may not target the specific infection and could contribute to antibiotic resistance. Question 5. During a home health visit, a nurse evaluates a patient's surgical wound and notes that it is well approximated with staples, without redness, drainage, or swelling. The patient reports minimal pain. Based on this assessment, which nursing intervention is most appropriate? A. Instruct the patient on signs of infection to monitor. B. Remove the staples and inspect the wound edges. C. Apply an antibiotic ointment to the wound area. D. 
Encourage the patient to remain on bed rest to promote healing. Correct answer. A. Instruct the patient on signs of infection to monitor. Rationale. Given that the wound is healing well with no signs of complications, educating the patient on signs of infection, e.g., increased redness, swelling, pain, drainage, is appropriate to ensure early detection and management if the situation changes. Removing the staples is not indicated in the absence of complications. Antibiotic ointment is not necessary for a wound showing no signs of infection, and bed rest is not required for a patient with a healing surgical wound without complications. Question 6. A patient with a stage 3 pressure ulcer is receiving negative pressure wound therapy. Which of the following outcomes should the nurse expect as a result of this therapy? A. Increased bacterial load in the wound. B. Dehydration of the wound bed. C. Reduction in wound size and exudate. D. Thinning of the surrounding skin. Correct answer. C. Reduction in wound size and exudate. Rationale, NPWT, also known as vacuum-assisted closure, helps in wound management by applying negative pressure to the wound bed. This promotes healing by reducing wound size, increasing granulation tissue formation, and decreasing exudate levels. It also helps remove infectious materials and reduces edema. NPWT does not increase the bacterial load or dehydrate the wound bed, rather, it aids in maintaining a moist wound environment conducive to healing. It does not cause thinning of the surrounding skin. Question 7. When assessing a patient with a wound, the nurse notes the presence of granulation tissue. How should the nurse interpret this finding? A. The wound is showing signs of infection. B. Healing is progressing and new tissue is forming. C. There is extensive necrosis that requires debridement. D. The wound is in the inflammatory phase of healing. Correct answer. B. Healing is progressing and new tissue is forming. Rationale, granulation tissue is a good sign in wound healing, indicating the formation of new tissue in the wound bed. It is typically bright red or pink, moist, and has a granular appearance. This finding suggests that the wound is in the proliferative phase of healing, where new tissue and blood vessels are forming to fill in the wound. It is not indicative of infection, necrosis, or the inflammatory phase, which is the initial response to injury. Question 8. A nurse is teaching a patient with a lower extremity ulcer about wound care at home. Which statement by the patient indicates a need for further teaching? A. I should keep the wound covered with a clean, moist dressing. B. I will elevate my leg to reduce swelling. C. I can clean the wound with alcohol to keep it from getting infected. D. I will inspect my wound daily for any changes. Correct answer, C. I can clean the wound with alcohol to keep it from getting infected. Rationale, cleaning a wound with alcohol is not recommended because it can damage the tissue in and around the wound, delay healing, and cause pain. The correct wound care involves keeping the wound clean and moist with appropriate wound cleansers or saline, covering it with a suitable dressing, elevating the affected limb to reduce swelling, and monitoring the wound for any signs of infection or deterioration. The patient's statement about using alcohol indicates a misunderstanding and the need for further education on proper wound care techniques. Question 9. Which type of wound dressing is best suited for a wound with dry eschar? A. Hydrogel dressing. B. Transparent film dressing. C. Hydrocolloid dressing. D. Alginate dressing. Correct answer. A. Hydrogel dressing. Rationale, hydrogel dressings are ideal for wounds with dry eschar because they provide moisture to the wound, which can help in autolytic debridement of necrotic tissue. Hydrogels create a moist healing environment, promoting tissue granulation and healing, and can help in pain management. Transparent film and hydrocolloid dressings are not designed for wounds with thick, dry eschar, as they do not provide the moisture needed for debridement. 
Alginate dressings are better suited for wounds with moderate to heavy exudate. Question 10. A nurse is preparing to apply a new dressing to a wound. Which step is most important to perform first? A. Assess the size, depth, and characteristics of the wound. B. Apply skin protectant around the wound edges. C. Choose the appropriate dressing size and type. D. Cleanse the wound with a saline solution. Correct answer. A. Assess the size, depth, and characteristics of the wound. Rationale, the first and most critical step before applying a new dressing is to thoroughly assess the wound. This assessment includes evaluating the size, depth, and characteristics of the wound, such as the presence of exudate, signs of infection, and the type of tissue present in the wound bed. This information guides the choice of the most appropriate dressing type and size, the need for wound cleansing, and any additional interventions to promote healing. Understanding the wound's current state is essential for effective management and selection of the right dressing materials. Question 11. A patient with a history of peripheral vascular disease has developed a full thickness wound on the lower leg with minimal exudate. Which dressing choice is most appropriate for this type of wound? A. Alginate dressing. B. Foam dressing. C. Hydrogel dressing. D. Silver impregnated dressing. Correct answer, C. Hydrogel dressing. Rationale. Hydrogel dressings are particularly suitable for full thickness wounds with minimal exudate, as they provide moisture to the wound, which is crucial for promoting a moist healing environment and facilitating autolytic debridement. Patients with peripheral vascular disease often have compromised blood flow, making moisture retention and enhancement of the healing environment critical. Foam dressings are more appropriate for wounds with moderate to high levels of exudate. Alginate dressings are best for wounds with significant exudate. Silver impregnated dressings are used when there is a concern about infection but are not specifically chosen based on wound depth or exudate level. Question 12. A nurse is evaluating a patient's wound healing after surgery. The wound edges are not approximated, and there is significant granulation tissue visible in the wound bed. This type of wound healing is known as A. Primary intention B. Secondary intention C. Tertiary intention D. Quaternary intention Correct answer B. Secondary intention. Rationale, secondary intention healing occurs when a wound's edges are not approximated, and the wound heals by granulation tissue formation, contraction, and epithelialization. This process is often seen in wounds that are left open due to infection, presence of foreign bodies, or because they have significant tissue loss. Primary intention healing occurs when wound edges are directly closed with sutures, staples, or adhesives, leading to minimal scarring. Tertiary intention, delayed primary closure, involves initially leaving the wound open due to infection or contamination and then closing it surgically once it is deemed clean. Quaternary intention is not a recognized term in wound healing. Question 13. During a wound assessment, the nurse notes that the wound bed is filled with soft, pink, pebble-like tissue. The nurse recognizes this tissue as A. Slough. B. Eschar. C. Granulation tissue. D. Fibrin. Correct answer. C. Granulation tissue. Rationale. Granulation tissue is soft, pink to red, pebble-like tissue that indicates healthy wound healing. It is composed of new blood vessels, connective tissue, and fibroblasts and signifies the wound is in the proliferative phase of healing. SLU is a soft, moist, yellow, or white tissue that may need to be removed to aid healing. Eschar is a hard, black, or brown necrotic tissue that often requires debridement. Fibrin is not typically visible as described and is more associated with the clotting process. Question 14. A nurse is applying a compression bandage to a patient with venous stasis ulcers. 
What is the primary reason for using compression therapy in this patient? A. To reduce the risk of infection. B. To decrease exudate production. C. To improve venous return. D. To increase wound temperature. Correct answer. C. To improve venous return. Rationale. Compression therapy is used primarily to improve venous return and reduce venous hypertension in patients with venous stasis ulcers. By applying graded compression, these bandages support the veins and reduce edema, promoting blood flow back towards the heart and facilitating wound healing. Reducing the risk of infection and decreasing exudate production are secondary benefits of improved circulation and reduced edema. Increasing wound temperature is not a primary goal of compression therapy. Question 15. When caring for a patient with an infected wound, the nurse anticipates the need to perform which action to support the healing process? A. Keep the wound dry at all times. B. Apply ice packs to reduce inflammation. C. Administer prescribed antibiotics. D. Increase protein intake to twice the normal daily value. Correct answer. C. Administer prescribed antibiotics. Rationale. In the case of an infected wound, administering prescribed antibiotics is essential to control and eliminate the infection, thereby supporting the healing process. Keeping the wound dry is not always appropriate, as a moist healing environment is often beneficial. Ice packs may be used for pain relief or to reduce swelling in some cases, but they are not a primary treatment for wound infection. While nutrition, including protein intake, is important for wound healing, doubling the protein intake without a specific nutritional assessment and recommendation may not be appropriate. Question 16. A nurse is preparing to clean a patient's wound. Which solution is most appropriate for routine wound cleansing to minimize tissue damage? A. Hydrogen peroxide. B. Normal saline. C. Iodine solution. D. 70% isopropyl alcohol. Correct answer. B. Normal saline. Rationale. Normal saline is the preferred solution for routine wound cleansing because it is isotonic and does not damage living cells or interfere with the healing process. Hydrogen peroxide, iodine solution, and isopropyl alcohol can be cytotoxic to the delicate granulation tissue in the wound bed and are generally not recommended for routine wound cleaning, especially in the granulation phase of healing. Question 17. Which assessment finding would be most concerning for a patient with a pressure ulcer on the heel? A. Presence of granulation tissue in the wound bed. B. A decrease in wound size over the past week. C. Black, non-tender tissue covering the wound surface. D. Serosanguineous drainage noted on the dressing. Correct answer. C. Black, non-tender tissue covering the wound surface. Rationale. Black, non-tender tissue, eschar. Covering the wound surface indicates necrosis and is concerning because it can mask the extent of underlying damage and infection. It often requires debridement to allow for proper assessment and healing. Granulation tissue and a decrease in wound size are positive signs of healing. Serosanguineous drainage is common in healing wounds and, while it needs to be monitored, it is not immediately concerning unless there is a significant increase or change in the type of drainage. Question 18. A nurse is educating a patient with a lower extremity wound about the importance of nutrition in wound healing. Which nutrient should the nurse emphasize as most critical for collagen synthesis and wound repair? A. Vitamin C. B. Iron. C. Protein. D. Zinc. Correct answer. A. Vitamin C. Rationale. Vitamin C is crucial for collagen synthesis and wound repair, making it a key nutrient in the healing process. It plays a significant role in the formation of new connective tissue and enhances the immune system's ability to fight infection. 
while iron, protein, and zinc are also important for wound healing. Vitamin C is specifically vital for collagen formation, which is essential for wound strength and integrity. Question 19. When choosing a wound dressing, what factor is most important to consider for a wound that is highly exudative? A. The dressing's ability to maintain a moist environment. B. The dressing's adhesive properties. C. The dressing's absorptive capacity. D. The dressing's transparency. Correct answer. C. The dressing's absorptive capacity. Rationale. For a highly exudative wound, the dressing's absorptive capacity is the most crucial factor to consider. The dressing must be able to manage the level of exudate effectively to prevent maceration of the surrounding skin and promote a suitable healing environment. While maintaining a moist environment is important for wound healing, in the context of a highly exudative wound, absorption takes precedence. Adhesive properties and transparency are secondary considerations and depend on the wound's location, patient's skin integrity, and the need for monitoring. Question 20. A patient presents with a wound that has a mix of red and yellow tissue in the wound bed. The yellow tissue is soft and stringy. How should the nurse document this observation? A. The presence of slough. B. The development of eschar. C. The formation of granulation tissue. D. The occurrence of fibrin deposition. Correct answer. A. The presence of slough. Rationale. Soft, stringy yellow tissue within a wound bed is characteristic of slough, which consists of dead tissue and cellular debris that needs to be removed to promote healing. Eschar is typically hard and black or brown, indicating necrotic tissue. Granulation tissue is red or pink and indicates healthy healing. Fibrin deposition is part of the clotting process and is not typically visible in the wound bed as described. Documenting the presence of slough is important for treatment planning, including possible debridement. Question 21. A nurse is caring for a patient who has developed a blister on the heel after a long surgery. What is the best initial intervention for this blister if it is intact and not infected? A. Lance the blister to release fluid. B. Cover the blister with a hydrocolloid dressing. C. Apply an antibiotic ointment and a gauze dressing. D. Leave the blister exposed to air to dry out. Correct answer. B. Cover the blister with a hydrocolloid dressing. Rationale, an intact, non-infected blister should be protected to prevent rupture and infection, promoting a moist healing environment that encourages natural reabsorption of the blister fluid. Hydrocolloid dressings are ideal as they can provide cushioning, protect the area from friction, and maintain a moist environment to facilitate healing. Lancing the blister or leaving it exposed to air increases the risk of infection and delays healing. Antibiotic ointment is not necessary unless there is evidence of infection. Question 22. During a home health visit, the nurse assesses a wound on a patient's leg that is red, warm to the touch, and swollen around the edges. The patient reports increased pain at the site. Which action should the nurse take first? A. Advise the patient to apply a cold compress to reduce swelling. B. Document the findings and continue to monitor the wound. C. Cleanse the wound with an antiseptic solution immediately. D. Notify the healthcare provider of the signs of possible infection. Correct answer. D. Notify the healthcare provider of the signs of possible infection. Rationale, redness, warmth, swelling, and increased pain are classic signs of infection. The nurse's first action should be to notify the healthcare provider for possible intervention, which may include prescribing antibiotics or ordering further diagnostic tests. While cleansing the wound might be part of the care plan, it should not precede consulting the healthcare provider. Documenting findings is essential, but not the first action in the presence of potential infection. Applying a cold compress is not appropriate for these symptoms and may delay necessary medical treatment. Question 23. 
A patient with a history of chronic ulcers has a new wound with yellowish-brown hard crust on the surface. The nurse recognizes this as a a sign of effective healing b necrotic tissue that requires debridement c dried exudate known as a scab d an indication of a fungal infection correct answer c dried exudate known as a scab rationale yellowish brown hard crust on the surface of a wound is typically dried exudate also known as a scab which forms as a wound begins to heal and the exudate dries out this is a natural part of the healing process for some wounds, protecting the wound bed as it heals underneath. While necrotic tissue requires debridement and a fungal infection would require specific treatment, a scab does not necessarily indicate these complications but should be monitored for any changes that might suggest infection or delayed healing. Question 24. For a patient with a wound that has a heavy malodorous discharge, which dressing type is most appropriate to manage the odor and exudate? A. Charcoal dressing. B. Silicone dressing. C. Transparent film dressing. D. Hydrogel dressing. Correct answer. A. Charcoal dressing. Rationale. Charcoal dressings are specifically designed to absorb heavy exudate and manage wound odor making them an excellent choice for wounds with malodorous discharge. The activated charcoal within the dressing traps odor molecules, significantly reducing odor. This type of dressing also helps in managing the exudate without drying out the wound. Silicone dressings are gentle on the skin and mainly used for their non-adherent properties. Transparent film dressings are not suitable for heavy exudate. Hydrogel dressings provide moisture, but do not effectively manage heavy exudate or odor. Question 25. A nurse is educating a patient on how to care for a healing wound at home. Which instruction is most important to include to prevent wound infection? A. Use hydrogen peroxide daily to clean the wound. B. Keep the wound dry and exposed to air as much as possible. C. Wash your hands before and after touching the wound or dressing. D. Apply a heat pack to the wound for 20 minutes three times a day. Correct answer. C. Wash your hands before and after touching the wound or dressing. Rationale, hand hygiene is the most critical measure to prevent wound infection. Washing hands before and after touching the wound or dressing significantly reduces the risk of introducing or spreading infection. Hydrogen peroxide can be cytotoxic and is not recommended for daily wound cleaning. Keeping the wound dry and exposed to air does not provide the moist environment necessary for optimal healing, and excessive drying can delay healing. Applying heat packs is not a universal recommendation for wound care and may not be appropriate for all types of wounds. Visit nursestudy.net for more nursing practice exams, care plans, and study guides.